The whole world's gone nuts for noodles. We consume over a hundred billion platefuls every year. Japan's deliciously nutty soba noodles have been pleasing palates in the land of the rising sun since the 1600s. And they're now becoming a global food phenomenon. How do they do it? Soba noodles are made from buckwheat, which isn't actually wheat at all. It's the seed of a flowering plant more closely related to the infamous Japanese knotweed. Buckwheat noodles are rich in vitamins and amino acids, and today they're more popular than ever. In Yamagata, the Ogawa Seimen factory is one of Japan's biggest noodle makers, producing over 5,000 tons of the stuff every year. Soba making starts with one main ingredient, buckwheat. The dried seeds arrive at the factory in 22 and a half kilogram paper sacks. Kenji Nagahashi sorts them and checks the batch is up to scratch. It might be high quality, but the hard black exterior of the seeds is utterly inedible. Kenji pours them down the processing chute that takes them through rollers to remove the tough skins. Then these wobbly boxes use vibration to separate the seed kernels. Only when they've got rid of the nasty stuff can they get on with the business of grinding them into flour. Industrial grinding can create heat, which would cause the soba flour to lose its natural nutty flavor. To keep things cool, they use 10 150 kilogram millstones made from volcanic rock to grind the seeds into a rough flour. But from the moment it's ground, the buckwheat starts to deteriorate. For speed, the ground buckwheat goes down another chute, taking it to the noodle-making part of the factory. When it gets there, it's mixed with water in giant steel tanks to make an unappetizing-looking grey mush. If you tried to shape noodles from this stuff, they would just fall apart. Regular wheat contains a sticky protein called gluten, which gives dough strength and elasticity. But there's no gluten in buckwheat. To avoid crumbly noodles, a mixture of wheat flour, water and yam flour packed with vitamin C and B1 is added. Dough master Shuhei Sugiyama checks every batch. <laughs> Once the dough's just right, it's rolled into a continuous sheet. At this stage, the dough looks like a thick grey carpet of plasticine, not appetizing. To turn it into something resembling food, it rolls into an aging box, three meters long and 10 tiers high. In less than an hour inside, it's matured to perfection. But even with much of the moisture gone, the dough is still more than a centimeter thick. So four consecutive rollers gradually flatten the dough, preserving the stretchy gluten and its elastic texture. The gray carpet rolls into a set of ferocious teeth, which slices it into thousands of supersized strands, each 3.6 meters long. Metal rods ferry the dough strands away. Hanging them vertically helps them dry out as they travel. A quick width check shows the noodles are the right size, but they still contain too much moisture to survive weeks on the shelf. For a proper drying out, the rows of rails carry them through a hole in the ceiling to the factory's upper floor. The entire level is dedicated to drying, with 200 fans whirring around the clock. A kilometer-long conveyor dries over 30 tons of noodles per day. It's not a job you can rush, 
The drying line moves at a snail-like 50 metres an hour. And knowing when they're ready takes some skill. Only noodles that glide past the fingers of Tomohiko Yamakawa are dry enough to pass on to the next stage. Twenty-four hours later, the noodles are ready. But at 3.6 meters long, they're more than a mouthful. So a cutting machine chops them into a bite-size 18 centimeters. Finally, it's weighed into packs and wrapped for freshness. 200,000 portions roll out of the Agawa factory every day. By any measure, that's oodles of noodles. Pole vaulting is not for the faint-hearted. Ranked as the hardest track and field event in the world, athletes risk life and limb as the pole propels them over a bar nearly as high as a house. To reach those dizzying heights, the pole has to be strong, light and flexible. And making them takes some technological wizardry. How do they do it? Fort Worth, Texas. Once upon a time, it was a sleepy town at the end of the cowboy trail. Today, it's a center for high-tech industry. And in amongst all the microchip makers, you'll find the SX Factory, where they produce vaulting poles used by athletes across America. World champion Sam Kendricks stakes his medal hopes on them. That's my job as an athlete. Find the correct pole with the correct speed and the correct timing to make that vault work out just so. People have been playing around with poles for thousands of years. The idea of using them to jump over a bar started in 1850 in Germany. And from there, the only way was up. Everything changed in the 1950s when fiberglass enabled athletes to jump higher than ever before. By 2018, the world record for men's pole vault was 6.16 meters and for women, 5.06. Designing poles with advanced materials is a job for engineers like Joseph Novak. The trickiest part of the design is making sure the pole bends properly. Where and how much it bends is down to a central section known as the sail. As the volta runs, they build up kinetic energy. The pole deforms when it's planted into the ground, briefly storing this energy. The pole then releases the stored energy, converting it into maximum height. This is the sail piece. Sail piece is a trapezoid shaped piece that determines the bend profile of the pole. Computer modeling allows Joseph to predict exactly how the pole will react when a 79 kilogram athlete plants it into the ground at nearly 40 kilometers an hour. The design is constructed out of layers of glass and carbon fiber that start out on rolls. So our process starts with an engineering drawing. This outlines the specs of the pole, such as the length, the materials used. And now that we have all the dimensions we need, we can come over here and our material is ready. We can just pull it out to length. But the poles can be up to 5.5 meters long. Thankfully, the factory's extended benches allow Joseph to measure and cut any length of fiberglass. Several layers of the pole are made from carbon fiber, a material stronger than steel. Unfortunately, the backing is slippery stuff, and a cut in the wrong place could ruin the whole sheet. So SX use a specialized flatbed cutting machine that pulls the material flat with suction as it slices through to the nearest millimeter. Once all the precision cutting's done, you're left with a little box filled with a few rolls of material. It's hard to believe that this material will make a 12-foot pole. 
Joseph has to somehow transform those pieces into a pole capable of bending to 65% of its original length. A long steel rod known as a mandrel provides a solid core to shape the layers around. The glass and carbon fiber sheets are impregnated with epoxy resin, which will bond the layers together. But not when it's cold. SX have the solution. Right now we have some hot oil running through these mandrels. Once they're heated to 60 degrees Celsius, the mandrels are ready to roll. So now we're tacking down the first ply to the mandrel. The mandrel, with the first layer of fiberglass attached, is placed into a giant rotating press. So this is the last pattern down, and it's a sail piece. It gives it a different profile that's not uniform. So you can see you have where there's a, a wider portion of the material, it's going to be stiffer in this section of the pole. And where it tapers out, we'll have less stiffness and less stiffness. That'll still give it its final bin profile. One by one, the layers of carbon fiber and fiberglass go onto the mandrel, pushed down by a force of 2.8 kilograms per square centimeter. The pole has been shaped, but if you tried to jump with it in this state, it would be limp as a noodle. To make it rigid, the material has to cure. The resin glues the layers together to create a strong and flexible structure. This happens in hot cylinders that work like an oven. So now we got the parts in the oven. Temperature elevates up to about 270 degrees. This temperature rise accelerates the chemical reaction known as cross-linking. When the material cross-links, it takes it from a soft, malleable material like this and turns it into a hard, rigid material like this. The poles bake for one hour and 20 minutes. They make up to 30 a day. That adds up to longer than a football pitch. The mandrels are removed before they cool, but top athletes can't take chances with their equipment. It has to be thoroughly tested before it sees action. Now we get to see if the calculations from the computer are accurate. We're going to put this pole into this machine that's going to compress it to 65% of its original length. A computerized vise exerts up to 145 kilograms of pressure on the pole, testing it to its limits. Test is going good, no failure. Any cracks would render the pole useless so Joseph needs to examine it carefully. It doesn't appear to be any cracking on this pole. It looks like it's good to go into inventory. For Sam Kendricks, this pole could power him to new heights.